Good morning, everyone. I am Pastor Joe Bauman Johnson, and I am so delighted to be with you this morning, especially because it's a gorgeous day, and we will have a lovely hour of worship this morning. Um, let's see. So there are a few announcements that are on the, the, the PowerPoint up here. I'm sure you can see them. And then um, don't miss the Goonies um, announcement. Kids and families, there's going to be a movie coming up in a week or so. And we shall start our service with the confession and forgiveness of sins. Please stand as you are able. I think I'll stand up over here. I think I'll stand up here a little bit so you can see me just a little bit better. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Most, most merciful God, Not free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, us renew us, us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of our almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We're going to sing uh, uh, the prayer for the day today, and it's, um, it's Dona Nobis Pacem, which is in Latin. It was written 500 years ago, and it's still a good song. It has the same words all throughout, which mean grant us peace, but it has three different melodies, and we hope you'll hear all three. This little choir is grades five through eight, and they're gonna do the psalm this morning, which is Psalm five, verse eight. So Psalm five, eight. And we're gonna do it three times. Mia's going to read it, that verse, then we're going to sing it, and then we're going to chant it. Lead me, Lord in your righteousness. 
because of those who lie in wait for me. Make your way straight before me. So have all the kids left? Or do we have, still have some? Okay, come on up. Come on up. Wonderful. Glad to hear that. You were wonderful this morning. That was just fabulous. I love to hear the kids sing. Okay. So everybody's afraid of me. <laughs> Okay, but I'm going to ask you to stand up again right away. So I'm going to ask that, why don't you come down on, on the carpet, okay? I'm going to ask that you pretend that you are cars driving, but there's no rules. But be really careful to not, um, to not bump over the communion wine, okay? So pretend that you're driving, but there aren't any rules, okay? Start. Uh, what do you think's happening? <clears throat> Are you kind of bumping into each other? Um, if you were cars, do you think there'd be a lot of accidents? Oh boy, it's, it's, it's just a mess. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, what do I have here? Stop and go, right? And these would be traffic laws, right? So what if we tried this? Okay, you guys go that way and face this way, okay? And you guys go this way, okay? And so, okay, I'll say stop to this group and go to this group, and so you guys can start walking. Well, just nobody bumping into each other. And now, go! And you guys can walk and there's no bumping into each other. Well, it works a little better, doesn't it? So, these would be laws. And God gave us laws as well. Does anybody know any of the laws that God gave us? Do you know the Ten Commandments at all? Anybody know what, say, one of the Ten Commandments might be? Yes, do not lie. There's some other big ones like do not murder. We know that one, right? Do not steal. Mm -hmm. So why do you think God would want us to have those laws? So that we don't hurt each other, right? You saw what happened when we didn't have any laws with God with you guys as bumper cars, just imagine what the world would be like if we didn't have laws. It would be terrible. We'd be so sad. So God gives us laws to be happy and to be able to live together when we, to live together well when we obey those laws, right? Okay. So God wants us to be happy and the law is given so that we might live well together. Let's say a prayer. 
Thank you, God, for the laws that you have given us. We know that you love us because you have given us the law. Amen. Okay? Thank you very much. You make great cars. The first reading today comes from Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The second re reading comes from 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I give you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and the other, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. <clears throat> Please rise as you are able. Through 37. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to counsel. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother and sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and sister, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. 
or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into heaven. You may be seated. <clears throat> Excuse my water, I get very dry. Grace and peace to you from the God of both law and grace. Amen. I spent many of my younger years as a smug Christian, believing in the superiority of my Christian faith. I'm still just as smug in all kinds of ways, but at least in one area, I've managed to break through a snobbish attitude and find a more experienced and thoughtful honesty. I used to feel that my Christian faith was above Jewish theology. As it seemed to me, Jews were required to follow all those laws, the Torah and such, in order to become righteous in God's eyes. But not us, not the Christians. We were exempt from all that stuff. All we had to do was believe Jesus was God's son, saved us from sin, and boom, all in. My beliefs at the time, I don't believe, were anti-Semitic. I had only but good wishes for Jews. I have also never been supersessionist, the belief that Christianity replaced Jews as the heirs to God's promise. The writings of Paul do not support supersessionist theology. As Paul writes in Romans 11, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. We Christians have been granted, grafted onto the family tree of the Jewish people, the people of the law. So what is Jewish law? A common description is often the Torah, the first five books of the Older Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These works have been in constant interpretational debate, probably, since when they came into being. It's estimated 400 BC being the end period of all the material being gathered and named as scripture for the Jewish people. But the stories and poems themselves were told in oral form for perhaps a thousand years before being collected into written form. The Jewish faith the law as a fixed, constant good, but also something in a constant state of analysis. Rabbis, both ancient and modern, have built communities of followers based on their particular interpretation of the Torah. Excuse me. Before my time interacting with a group of Jews, I could only see the law as something limiting. An orthodox Sabbath is nothing but boring, and me set free from all of that. And then I actually spent time with Jews through a book club critiquing literary works through the lens of theology. This Christian Jewish book club was set up by my church and a synagogue, and it changed everything I thought about Judaism. Amazing how one's perspectives change when one listens. 
Modern Judaism is similar to modern Christianity in the sense that there is a range of denominations in the faith, ranging from the very conservative, the Orthodox, we live in an Orthodox neighborhood, it's quite amazing to see people walking um, to their synagogue on Saturdays with the hats and the dark clothes and the, the whole thing. It's lovely. Ranging from the very conservative, the orthodox, to the more liberal in theology and practice. Our book club had all of these denominations of Jewish, including cultural Jews who identify as Jewish but to not practice any form of the Jewish religion. The Christians were all EL, ELCA Lutherans coming from the same church. The revelation for me was the love of the law in so many of the practicing religious Jews. To them, it was anything but limiting or boring. It was and is a treasure. And when the Orthodox Jews spoke of the Sabbath, a 24-hour time consciously held back from the world and given only to church, family, and friends, it was the Sabbath as a blessed, sacred trust. We live next to an Orthodox family, and on Saturdays, they go to synagogue and then come back and... People come over and they sit out on, the, on their porch and it's a lovely family gathering and friends and kids run around and it's what they do. Um, some, of the, some of the adults will talk of Torah writings, things like that. It's, it is every Saturday and it's just, you know, that is their Sabbath. My new friends showed me the practice of the law as it matters in one's life, and it was not legalism, being concerned about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. I've come to realize legalism about the law is less about the law and more about the state of one's heart. Legalism is when you get very concerned about the minutia of the law and missing the state of what the law is about. And legalism occurs in both Judaism and Christianity, as Jesus will tell us in this next passage, today's Gospel Passion. Here is my understanding of the Jewish faith from reading a number of sources, my seminary classes, and my own interactions. Judaism practices, Judaism proclaims a living God who, sorry, I'm leaving you just waiting. Judaism practices a living God who is the center of a universe, a God interested in humans, who believes humans have the power to live a moral life. In the Jewish faith, to live according to the law is to live honestly and outwardly focused, taking time for study of the faith, having children to ensure the future, if childless, acting in ways which protect the future to come, and looking forward to the time of redemption, where each person in the world understands one's obligations in, to the world as a whole. If any of you, when asked, how do you get to heaven, and you reply, by being a good person, you are expressing Jewish theology, not Christian. Christianity has a different outlook on the law and on humans. Christians believe the law is possible to keep. Humans are incapable of living a life acceptable to God's holy self. No matter how hard we try to keep the law, we cannot. The law judges us as guilty, but our faith in Jesus Christ atones for our failure. 
That's grace. That's why we talk so much as, about grace. God gives us their, our salvation because we count on Jesus to make it right. A quick oversimplification would be Christians and Jews share the same God, Father Abraham, but in terms of finding favor with God, Christianity is about what you believe, while Judaism is about what you do. Does that make sense? Our gospel today is a passage that has sometimes been used to illustrate Christian beliefs overpowering Jewish law. The, pa the passage continues what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching to a large group of people, and these verses are coming right after the Beatitudes. Remember, the blessed are verses. In this passage, Jesus often starts his statement with, you have heard, and but I tell you. This could make it seem like he's presenting a new principle which overturns the earlier one, i.e., Christian beliefs now replacing Jewish law. But it's not that simple. It is not replacement that Jesus is illustrating, but deeper interpretation which have implications for community. With this passage, Jesus moves from the individual, blessed are those, to actions which affect the entire society. Murder, yes, is condemned by Jesus, but anger as well, since its presence undermines the entire group. A, communion, a community filing angry lawsuits against each other, verses 23 to 26, is not a healthy one. Jesus is not eliminating the Torah law. He is expanding upon it and does so for the sake of community. Like other good rabbis, he takes the law, do not murder, and opens it up for greater interpretation. These laws should never be seen as Jesus shoving over the law to bring Christianity's viewpoint. My, Christ, my Christian Jewish book club went on for about a year and a half, and it was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life because the participants made the decision at the beginning to be honest with each other and also gentle, giving opinions with care. And on an evening when we got nitty-gritty with each other about our respective faiths, I heard my Jewish friends say to us, their Christian friends, I've always felt sorry for you Christians. We need only to do good deeds to honor a loving God, but you are required to hold belief, and no one can do that forever. No, I'm glad to be Jewish. <laughs> I think it was at that moment my smugness about Christianity disappeared. It was replaced by a humble understanding of my ignorance about the religions of others and the quiet determination to learn more about them. I hope my story encourages you to exploration as well. Amen. Please stand and let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to the dead. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we have some
someone to come do the prayers. Thank you. Yeah, please be seated. The response of the day is receive our prayer. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Inspire your church that it may be a sign of life throughout the world. From the, explore, from the exploration of faith with children and new believers to missionaries and bishops, shape lives of faithfulness so that all find abundant life in your ways. Merciful God. Nourish your creation. Accompany all who plant and water. Bless the work of farmers. Provide for substance, farmers facing drought and climate change. Guide the work of agricultural scientists towards sustainable ways to feed the world. Merciful God. Give growth where there seems to be no hope for life. In nations and regions where reconciliation seems impossible, empower peacemakers with your spirit. Where death holds sway through violence, disease, and hunger, equip relief workers to bring hope. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Nurture all in need, especially Claire, Brett, Dennis, Chelsea, Doris, Amy, and Sean. Bring healing to all who experience trauma caused by systems of injustice and destructive relationships. Give courage to those struggling to repent and those seeking reconciliation. Sustain all who work for restoration. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Encourage this congregation. Call us to a common purpose and keep us from quarreling. Turn our hearts towards you and guide our leaders so that our choices may be life-giving for all. Merciful God, thanks be to you for the lives of all who have died in Christ. Teach us to follow them in your ways and gather us with them into the promise of eternal life with you. Merciful God, we bring to you our needs and hopes, O God trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. Come now, O Prince of Peace, Make it us one body. Come, O oh Lord Jesus, reconcile your people. Come now, O oh God of love, make us one body. Come, O oh Lord Jesus, reconcile
We offer our gifts to you, O Lord. Amen. Anyone who believes in the grace of Jesus Christ is present in the bread and wine at the Lord's table is welcome to share community with this community of believers. You are indeed holy, O Lord, almighty and merciful. You are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it for all to and gave it for all to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in the remembrance of me. With this bread and this cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Let us say together um, the let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Please stand. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. You may be seated.
one cup of blessing which we bless. And we, though many, throughout the earth, we are one body in the
Please stand as you are able. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the realm, in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. May God, who lightens all our paths, accompany you on your journey this day and always. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you and give you peace. Now go in peace. Be light for the world. Thanks be to God.